Hello and welcome to this panel discussion hosted by the Observer Research Foundation on the new grouping of the United States, India, Israel and the United Arab Emirates. The foreign ministers of the four countries met virtually in October this year to enhance cooperation and partnerships. The group has been dubbed by analysts as the new Quad or the Middle East Quad. And expectedly, this new minilateral has led to a lot of speculation coming as it does on the heels of the signing of the Abraham Accords a year ago between Israel and the UAE, which was brokered by the United States. There has also been a historic visit this week by the Israel Prime Minister to the UAE, where both stressed on the new reality of the region. The minilateral raises questions on the wider geopolitical implications for West Asia, for India, the competition between US and China, its impact on regional politics, and also the potential of minilateral diplomacy. We will be discussing this with the distinguished panel that we have assembled, and I'd like to introduce them. Ambassador Navdeep Suri is former Indian ambassador to UAE, Egypt, and director of the Center for New Economic Diplomacy. Ambassador Mark Zoffer is former ambassador of Israel to India, Australia, and Ireland. Dr. Parna Pandey is research fellow and director at the Initiative on the Future of India and South Asia at the Hudson Institute in the US. And Dr. Hassan Al Hassan is research fellow for Middle East policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Bahrain. And I'm Sunaina Kumar, senior fellow at the Center for New Economic Diplomacy. I'm going to request each of our speakers to offer brief opening comments to get us started. Ambassador Zoffer, if you could get us started on this. Thank you very much indeed for that. And it's always a pleasure to be with the with the ORF. Uh, um, truth, to my, truth to tell, it's always the worst thing to be the first speaker because it's so easy uh, to deconstruct uh, what I have to say. Uh, but I'll have a go at it anyway and hope that uh, some of the remarks, at least that I'll make, uh, will last uh, throughout this discussion. I'd like to split uh, my remarks into two. First of all, the declared or the announced aim of this new grouping, according to Quad, I prefer not to, and the international aspects uh, of it. Now, to start with, it's important to mention that this is not a uh, frivolous fly-by-night initiative. Uh, rather, it'll be an ongoing one. Uh, the opening, as you said, uh, came from uh, the kickoff came with the with the foreign minister's virtual meeting in October. But as you may know, there are now behind the scenes uh, discussions, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, another F foreign minister meeting was to take place uh, next year, perhaps in the uh, background of the expo in uh, the UAE, uh, when things are uh, moved have moved on a little bit. The stress is on economics and especially infrastructure in such fields as water, environment, space, healthcare, uh, agriculture. Uh, and I am uh, given to understand that the current stage of where we are at right now is one of uh, uh, identifying specific projects, their financing, their uh, location, the involvement of the private sector, uh, etc. In short, this is being perceived as a, as a positive initiative, a positive agenda, uh, uh, not a negative one directed against a third country or a third uh, a party, uh, but one which is designed to bring tangible benefits uh, to the parties involved, uh, to build on, on the new regional architecture, uh, which was predicated by uh, the Abraham Accords, which of course wasn't only uh, between Israel and the UAE. Uh, we have Bahrain, Morocco, uh, to a certain extent Sudan and hopefully others. But the idea is to strengthen these accords uh, for the benefit of the parties involved in a region in which all of the parties uh, have direct uh, and serious interests. Now, if I look at the international aspects, uh, I would say the following. Uh, diplomats, I believe, and analysts, uh, think tanks, we're always on the, on the lookout for ulterior motives uh, and uh, perhaps uh, new uh, or other uh, issues that are on the table uh, which haven't been said by the parties in any initiative. And, and truth to tell, uh, in my experience of over 40 years in foreign affairs, uh, they're usually correct. Uh, I think in every single uh, a new multilateral or, or minilateral or even bilateral grouping, there is always an elephant, uh, or as you said in, in the ORF report, perhaps a dragon uh, in every room. Uh, 
Uh, and this is because of the dynamics of the international system uh, and it revol in, in which uh, uh, there's bipolar or even multipolar world. Uh, but the question isn't whether there is an elephant or a dragon in the room, but how prevalent is this elephant? How important is the, the dragon in any grouping? Now, in the, Asi in the uh, Asian quad, or, or in AUKUS, uh, uh, the, the elephant or the dragon, especially the dragon, is clearly there uh, and uh, running around. But I think in the Middle East, or this Middle East quad, not particularly like that word as far as this, this uh, grouping is concerned, but nonetheless, the situation is very different. I think that Israel, uh, and to a certain extent the UAE, uh, are extremely focused uh, on Iran, the Iranian threat. Israel is the only uh, country in the world which is uh, threatened with annihilation by an Iran bent on, receiving, on achieving nuclear weapons. Clearly, uh, we are, are extremely focused uh, and preoccupied with the Iranian threat. Whereas the United States, uh, and, and, and that's a certain, true for a certain, to a certain extent with the UAE, perhaps in lesser intensity. Whereas the United States and uh, India might be focused on, on China. Now, if we look at these two issues, the Iranian uh, problem or issue and the, the China issue, I, I think I I, it's important to note that the following. Uh, certainly Israel, and I guess the UAE as well, although I'm less knowledgeable about that, uh, have absolutely no interest in, in joining an alliance or a grouping which is dedicated against China. We have a very good relationship with China. We have no interest in, in, in getting China to be uh, part and parcel of our uh, of the of the groupings that or the the, the countries that that uh, look at it uh, unfavorably, uh, and we want to continue that. And so we have no interest whatsoever, national interest, uh, in in antagonizing anta antagonizing China. I think that's true to a large extent of the UAE, but of course uh, I'll be I'll speak less of that. Whereas on the other hand, uh, India. Uh, um, uh, while we look at Iran and the UAE does, I think India uh, and, and to a certain extent the United States are not interested in joining uh, uh, um, uh, Israel uh, or the UAE in an anti-Iranian uh, uh, approach to, to, uh, uh, to, to the situation in the Middle East. Uh, and I presume therefore that India uh, has no interest at all in joining an anti-Iranian alliance of such a nature. Now, given that, uh, our preoccupation, as you say, the two, it's called, I saw in Indian press, it's called the two U's and the two I's. But I think if we look at the, the, the issue, uh, all of this might change. I'm not saying it won't change, but if we are where we are right now, if Iran uh, 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 achieves nuclear uh, weapon capability, or if the Chinese-Iranian pact, which we know, develops into something much bigger, and much more nefarious than it is today, then this uh, grouping might take on a different type of, uh, of, of uh, approach to the international community uh, than it does at this moment in time. But I think we also have to uh, remember that sometimes, not always, very, in fact, that's rarely, if something looks like a duck, uh, walks like a duck, uh, and quacks like a duck, it might actually be a duck. Uh, and in this case, what we are talking here is of an economic grouping. Uh, uh, that's the primary thrust of it, not dedicated against a third party, but dedicated for themselves, the building up of economic infrastructure uh, in, in, in a crucial region, uh, which we all have vested interests in. And I think that at this stage, and with this I'll finish, that the elephant uh, and the dragon that is in the room right now is more likely to be a toy elephant and a toy dragon, and only time will tell whether this elephant and this dragon uh, actually becomes animated and turns into a real uh, um, issue for this uh, quad. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ambassador Zoe, for some very interesting uh, comments coming from you. Uh, you see it more as an economic grouping and uh, not directed against a third party. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Pandey now um, to offer her comments. Um, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. And again, I'd like to start by thanking Observer Research Foundation for inviting me to speak here today and a pleasure to be on a panel with such distinguished speakers. Um, U.S. grand strategy since the end of the Second World War has been to prevent the rise of any peer rivals and, and build a network of allies and partners across the world that would bolster this liberal international order. 
During the Cold War, this involved building larger blocks. Over time, there has been an understanding that smaller, um, you know, you can call them multilaterals, minilaterals, smaller groupings are easier um, as larger coalitions are difficult to build and sustain. Um, for example, the Indo-Pacific is an open and a loose grouping of countries, not a Cold War style bloc. And so what we see is the United States has been encouraging smaller groupings of countries with whom it has economic and strategic interests. The new Quad or Quad West or Middle East Quad is actually brings together two of the most dynamic economies of the Middle East, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, with a rising India and there is resident external power, the United States. So just as the original Quad, um, India, Japan, Australia, and US was an attempt to draw historically inward focused India into playing a bigger role in, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the way I see this Quad is that this is another attempt to in some ways encourage India to reclaim its position in what was or what is its civilizational and geographical sphere of influence, the Western Indian Ocean and the Gulf. And from the United States point of view, the more India plays a bigger role in, in the region, whether it's to its east or to its west, it helps American grand strategy and American national security interests. Uh, Ambassador Sofa referred to this, the two quads do share similar concerns. Um, there is a fear of expansionism. Um, from, you know, from the US point of view, there's China in one case and Iran and even Turkey in the other. Uh, but the regional countries, um, India, US, uh, UAE and Israel, do have their concerns over American isolationism and whether or not the US is going to stay in the region and is going to be is going to support its partner and allies. Um, Sunaina so mentioned this at the start of the talk that um, at the October meeting, um, all four foreign ministers spoke about why they sort of uh, why this make why this grouping me, uh, sort of is 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 critical. And I'd like to sort of you know pull out a few words from what each of the foreign ministers said uh, to emphasize how each one of the countries looks at the core, at this new grouping. Secretary of State Blinken referred to the four countries as leveraging each other's quote-unquote, complementary capabilities, while the Israeli foreign minister, uh, Yair Lapid, emphasized on, quote-unquote, synergy in, again, quote, infrastructure, digital infrastructure, transport, and maritime security. Um, the UAE foreign minister, Abdullah bin Zayed, uh, spoke of the special bonds that distinguish the countries, whereas uh, external affairs minister of India, Jesh, Dr. Jay Shankar, spoke said that all three countries are India's quote-unquote closest relationships. Why does this matter? Because if we look at it, the United States is the key security partner and the major defense supplier for the other three countries. The U.S. supplies 68 percent of all arms purchased by the Emirates, 78 percent by Israel, and one of the top four suppliers to India today. Um, Israel is a vital American ally, and so is the United Arab Emirates. Um, if U.S. is the key security partner, India is a key economic partner for all three countries. Trade between India and U.S. stats stands at almost 150 billion. Uh, India between India and the United Arab Emirates stands at around 60 billion. And so, as of now, it is still an economic forum. But I do believe, and here I will pull from what Ambassador Sofa said, think tanks do look for, um, for a hidden motive. Um, and here we see, or we would like to see an underlying geopolitical imperative. Washington is concerned about expansionism, Chinese, Iranian, uh, and Turkish. And American policy has been to encourage regional partners so that US does not have to carry the burden of being the global policeman. Uh, while India, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates shares many of U.S. concerns. Their views, and I agree with Ambassador Sofa, don't align on Iran or on even on China. Um, these countries are concerned about American isolationism. They face threats from homegrown and regional terrorism. And they are all concerned about ramifications of Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, especially if we look at it in the context of the U.S. withdrawal from the region.
how the new quad evolves um you know will be seen in the coming months and years um i hope as ambassador sofa said it is something which you know which isn't uh, one of those fora which meets once or twice a year and talks about economic um and you know sort of you know um a technological co- sort of you know um uh, collaborations but that it becomes something which is bigger than that and actually builds on the synergies which all four countries share um but uh, i think sort of the other quad took 12 years to become what it is today i hope this quad takes you know a few years to become a uh, a formal organization which contributes more uh, than uh, than many others are um i'll stop there and i look forward to the discussion thank you thank you dr pandey uh you've laid out for us the grand strategy of the united states which actually fits into um the mini lateral and also hinted at the hidden motives that might exist uh, i'd like to invite ambassador suri now uh, well first of all just a simple question at um, uh, the point that dr pande um finished with which is that uh, do you see this court taking off sooner and then of course um, please add to that i think there's a fairly strong uh, tailwind uh, behind this uh, new grouping um i actually uh, you know um, uh, would disagree with the basis so first uh, reluctance to call it a quad <laughs> simply simply because as you said if it's a, it quacks like a duck and <laughs> walks like a duck then it is a duck um you know uh, and in in one of the pieces that i wrote now i was trying to avoid uh, the uh, uh confusion of uh, too many acronyms and and and, and uh, suggested that maybe we could call the old one the apq or the asia pacific quad and call this one the waq or the west asia quad um uh, look i i think uh, uh, the uh, indications clearly are uh, that um, uh, and post the october uh, virtual meeting there's also been contact between senior officials to work on the agendas uh, that have been identified uh, there is um, uh, uh, strong indication that the foreign ministers would meet uh, in person in, in dubai potentially in march um on sidelines of the expo um beyond that uh, uh, there are other things in the air right um and the the uh, uh, prime minister benet has just visited uh, abu dhabi and the indian prime minister is going there next month uh, if i am not letting out too many state secrets um uh, that's the kind of momentum that is there uh, in the in in the relationships um what dr pandey mentioned uh, from quoted according dr jayashankar uh, that uh, uh, this is these are our closest partners um there was a brookings india study i think 2 years back which said that the uh, um, uh, that that israel and uae are the two countries most trusted by indians in the middle east that part part of a part of a survey that they did uh, and the orf itself did a uh, foreign policy survey of the youth which said that the us is the most trusted uh, country amongst young indians so i think that the mechanics of that is fairly uh, uh, evident what's interesting to me is uh, you know to take off on the economic dimension um, and, and uh, dr pande mentioned india ua trade I think many people actually don't realize that UAE is India's third largest trading partner after the US and China. Um uh and um not just that but the role of Dubai. So if if our trade with UAE is 60 billion dollars or of which 32 billion dollars is is uh, uh, Indian exports. Uh a good chunk of that goes to third countries leveraging uh Dubai's uh, exceptional uh, infrastructure for transshipments uh, to other Gulf countries. even to pakistan in some cases and certainly to east africa and ethiopia and beyond uh, so so uh, dubai does play that role i was in dubai last week uh, and and met some uh, fairly senior people there and uh, uh, they are already looking at uh, uh, potential for a kind of a multimodal corridor that connects uh, india uh, with the uh, all mumbai all the way to haifa and the two routes that they are looking at one is uh, by rail uh, from jabal ali uh, through saudi arabia into jordan and across uh, and the second one uh, which seems to be getting a bit more traction now is via uh, 
uh, Iraq because the, it already has an excellent road infrastructure and perhaps a shorter route into, into Jordan and onwards to Haifa. It, it gives you an example of the kind of transport linkages that we are talking about, where uh, cargo starting from Mumbai um, can get on a ship to Javilali uh, and, and go on into Iraq and, and then to Haifa and then we go on again into Piraeus in, in Greece and, and onwards into Europe and cutting uh, down the travel times considerably. Um, I think that as we go forward in this and purely from an economic standpoint, Dubai is going to play a critical role, not just because it's almost equidistant between India and uh, Israel, uh, but because it is already such a large hub for Indian business. There are some 500 Indian companies with their Middle East and North Africa headquarters in, in Dubai. There are 23 Indian banks that have already got a presence in, in, in the Dubai International Financial Center. And so what it means is that they, that critical mass of business and finance uh, that is going to be needed to promote trade linkages is already existing in, in, in a place like uh, Dubai. And so uh, I met some Indian business uh, leaders over there and they are salivating at the prospects that now open up of expanded trade uh, linkages because sitting there, they are best positioned to take advantage of it. Not that our friends from uh, Israel are any uh, further behind. Uh, it was quite interesting to see that uh, the Federation of International Indo-Israel Chambers uh, of Commerce have opened their office, guess where, in Dubai. Um, uh, and and, and uh, so they, they want to try and bring uh, the uh, uh, links between, trading links between India and Israel together via Dubai. Uh, I thought it was even more interesting that the Indian and uh, uh, Israeli consuls general in Dubai have already taken it upon themselves to get the trilateral process off the ground without waiting for formal uh, mechanisms to emerge. So they did this really interesting India-Israel UAE business promotion event at the India Pavilion in Dubai last month. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm just giving you an example that, you know, there are already um, uh, uh, dynamics uh, at work uh, to take this uh, uh, to take this forward. Um, Something that could give a lot of encouragement to this process uh, is India is fast tracking its FTAs with UAE and Israel. I think the India UAE FTA may happen literally within the next few weeks. Um, the India Israel FTA is being scheduled or targeted at least for uh, early uh, 2022. And uh, uh, coming out of uh, uh, Prime Minister Bennett's visit uh, to Abu Dhabi, we heard that uh, the Israel UAE FTA is also being fast tracked from July 22. They want to get it done by January or March 22. So once these uh, trade arrangements are in place, I think they will give a further impetus uh, to that economic uh, dimension. I am not saying that uh, the uh, the uh, security dimension will not emerge. I think it is it is very much. Uh, uh, in the interests of the countries to do it, but not talk about it. Uh, so think tanks may end up guessing and speculating uh, while the uh, practitioners go about their, their task quietly uh, in, uh, in uh, seeing how uh, things are going to, uh, going to develop. Uh, but you know, um, on the on Ambassador Zofer's elephant and dragon analogy, uh, you know, my own sense is that Minilaterals like this one give you the luxury that you don't have to agree on everything. Uh, there's enough flexibility. You haven't signed up in an alliance document or, uh, or a treaty or something. So there's enough flexibility that uh, you, you can agree on a bunch of things and move forward with those even where, uh, even as you uh, uh, don't take an active uh, uh, coordinated view on areas where there's a divergence of uh, uh, opinions. So I, I think... Uh, to that extent, uh, you know, the four countries will uh, find ways to uh, to go about it. But nevertheless, uh, you know, as somebody who's um, spent a fair bit of time in the in, in, in West Asia, uh, I would just say that the pace at which events are out unfolding is breathtaking. I mean, if if somebody had spoken about this or speculated about this two years back, you would have said, go take a walk somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and and now, you know, 
uh, post the Abraham Accords, post the really uh, dynamic situation between Israel and UAE, we're seeing that new opportunities are emerging that we couldn't have conceived a few years back. And, and, and the countries in the region, uh, um, I think uh, whether it's India or UAE or Israel and the US, of course, are showing uh, that they are sufficiently nimble in their diplomatic approach to take advantage of these emerging uh, opportunities. Let me start there, so now. Thank you, Ambassador Suri. Uh, you pointed out the huge potential for infrastructure cooperation, for trade cooperation that exists uh, within this uh, minilateral. Uh, I will now turn to Dr. Al Hassan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be here. It, it truly is a uh, quite quite a privilege. Um, it's it's actually great uh, to come last because one can position oneself clearly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the panel and, and, and sort of engage with their arguments. Um, I suppose my my uh, main argument is that this is a multilateral whose potentialities remain highly unclear and highly tentative and very much in the air. Um, and I think uh, if we were to to position ourselves on a spectrum where perhaps Ambassador Suri falls on the on the more optimistic side, I think I'd probably be on the on the other on the other end of that spectrum. Um, the way I see it is, how likely is this to evolve into a geopolitical or a security grouping? I think there's a a degree of uh, uh, perhaps agreement among members of the panel that this is highly unlikely, uh, at least for the time being, uh, especially because unlike other uh, uh, groups, such as uh, the Indo-Pacific Quad, for example, it is unclear who the rival is. There does not seem to be a shared uh, uh, understanding, a shared threat perception of a specific rival against which uh, uh, this geopolitical or security grouping would be directed against. Right? Unlike AUKUS, which has a clear anti-China uh, or, or Chinese uh, uh, orientation. Um, and, and this is why I think I would, I would strongly resist the urge to draw a parallel with the Quad, uh, because I think that parallel is, uh, uh, would, would really stretch uh, the analogy a bit too far. And I think the, 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 the differences and, and, and similarities would not uh, um, allow for such a comparison uh, or a parallel to be to be made. So clearly, I think uh, uh, it's obvious that the UAE and Israel uh, really don't want to be uh, part of an anti-China uh, coalition. Uh, and I think India would also find it very difficult to be against uh, an anti-Iran coalition, given India's um, uh, obviously multifaceted uh, relations with Iran. Uh, the US uh, is, is tentative, I would say. It will all depend on how the Vienna talks go and whether they end up reaching a, a nuclear understanding or an agreement with Iran. And I think that will obviously... Uh, uh, shape the future of U.S.-Iranian relations. But the point being uh, that uh, uh, there isn't a clear rival against um, whom this geopolitical or security grouping would be uh, directed against. I think in the geopolitical realm, it's also important to look at the motivations of the individual actors. And we've heard uh, uh, bits and pieces of that uh, over the past three presentations. I agree entirely with Dr. Pandey that the U.S. Uh, would like... Uh, Greater to see greater burden sharing uh, in the in the in the Middle Eastern region or the Western Indian Ocean, uh, however however defined or however conceived, uh, I think definitely it looks to India as a potential partner which can pick up the slack. It also looks towards the UAE and Israel and some of its traditional security partners in the region. I'm highly skeptical as to whether India would like to share a greater part of the burden. I highly doubt it. And I doubt that the U.S. or that India, pardon, uh, uh, is necessarily aligned in its own perceptions of what its role should be in the Western Indian Ocean and in the Middle East vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis what the U.S. believes India's role should be. I don't think there is there's a clear alignment there. Uh, I think the U.S. tends to be over-optimistic as to what its uh, uh, partners who agree with it in, in on specific issues or in specific regional uh, contexts, uh, uh, I think it tends to be to, to, to overemphasize and, and, and overimagine uh, the extent of the agreement on other issues. Um, likewise, I think um, I'm not going to, to talk about Israel because Ambassador Sofer is obviously more uh, knowledgeable about about this. But I think India, to, to a large extent, is projecting 
considerably its own concerns over China into this minilateral grouping. I think there was a lot of optimism that this would, especially in the Indian press, uh, that uh, this would somehow uh, constitute a coalition that will help contain China's either geopolitical or geoeconomic uh, uh, influence in the Middle East or in the Western Indian Ocean. And it's hopefully something I'll, I'll, I'll expand on in a bit. But finally, I think the UAE's motivations are, are, are extremely important in this regard, in the sense that the UAE really seems to view this as simply one minilateral initiative among a key set of partners, among other minilateral initiatives. And so the, the, the UAE is, uh, uh, has extremely been, and, and pardon the expression, promiscuous in its pursuit of uh, uh, relations beyond its traditional security partnership with the US. So we've seen the UAE uh, uh, be very um, uh, uh, active in the Eastern Mediterranean theater, for example, uh, uh, being part of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. It's obviously part of the GCC. It, it signed the Abraham Accords with a, with, a, with, a, with a different set of actors. It's part of this multilateral initiative that we're talking about today. And so uh, the UAE is, is really uh, um, keen on, I think, is pursuing a, a maximum latitude strategy or a maximum maneuverability strategy, engaging in, in uh, partnerships of various sorts in order to allow itself uh, 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 the greatest amount of, of nimbleness or latitude in its own foreign policy maneuvering. The second big point that I'd like to, to address is whether this can really be a, a, an economic coalition or a geoeconomic coalition. Um, and I think the idea here, the implicit idea seems to be, uh, among some at least, uh, that um, uh, this can serve as a geoeconomic coalition that will have the vocation of providing funding for infrastructure, development projects, connectivity projects, and so on, implicitly in order to offer an alternative to Chinese BRI funding. I think, I think this uh, idea of, an, of, of, of this group, uh, economic or geoeconomic grouping being an implicit alternative to, to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative is, I think, one that's present in the minds of, of uh, uh, many of the multilaterals advocates, uh, including in India. I think this, uh, and I think this idea is partly animated or this expectation is partly animated by this grand idea that somehow the minilateral uh, uh, in question will bring together Israeli tech, uh, uh, um, Emirati funding and project management expertise with Indian manufacturing, right? Uh, uh, this formula that I think we've heard over and over again, that will magically somehow have a transformational impact on the geoeconomic uh, sort of scene in the region. I think the issue is that there are a lot more frictions and, and, and uh, uh, complications in current investment arrangements between uh, uh, different di uh, 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 dyadic um, relationships among these, these four countries than, than I think many are ready to, to recognize. Um, if you look at, um, uh, granted, uh, the Abraham Accords are, are only one year old, but uh, the, the pace at which UAE Israeli investments are proceeding are, are nowhere near uh, what is being often advertised and, and spoken about. There, there are real frictions and, and issues, including in things like defense industrial partnerships, for example, that are proving harder to achieve on the ground uh, uh, than they are often being spoken about. But even I think older and more established partnerships, such as those between the Arab Gulf states, UAE and Saudi Arabia, especially in India, are also hitting uh, uh, very important stumbling blocks. Many of the, tail, the, the, the tailwinds behind UAE and Saudi investments and, and, and joint ventures between national champions, both um, on the Arab Gulf side or on the Indian side, are, are clearly dissipating to a large extent, especially with the announcement of the cancellation of the Aramco uh, reliance deal, the, the, the stumbling blocks that are being uh, uh, faced by uh, the Aramco Adnoc uh, uh, project to, to construct a, a refining complex in Maharashtra, uh, and, and many of the legacy investment issues uh, that uh, the Arab Gulf states have faced uh, in India. I think there, there are obviously also broader concerns about the medium-term health of the Indian economy, for example, which predate the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're, we've probably all heard of the great, uh, 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 the great slowdown thesis of, of people like Arvind Subramanian uh, uh, and others who are obviously much more knowledgeable uh, than I am about uh, the state of the Indian economy. 
Even this idea of multimodal trade corridors that Ambassador Suri alluded to, I tend to be highly skeptical. Uh, for one thing, unlike the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, there is no clear financial and geopolitical sponsor that will drive these multimodal trade corridors or connectivity projects uh, 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 from start to finish and, and really accompany their uh, uh, materialization. It is also entirely unclear to me why such a corridor would uh, uh, favor Indian trade or Indian exports, say, as opposed to Chinese trade or Chinese exports, right? It could very well be that this corridor that stretches from Jebel Ali to Haifa could very much be much more of a boon to China, which I must emphasize is the UAE's and the Arab Gulf states' largest trading partner, uh, and uh, is actually making significant headway in, uh, 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 unlike, for example, the EU or India or other traditional partners of the Arab Gulf states, in signing a multilateral uh, free trade agreement with the GCC, so including Saudi Arabia uh, and the rest of the Arab Gulf, Gulf states. And I think there are really, there, there, are, there are big problems with certain legs of these multimodal trade corridors. Saudi Arabia hasn't signed on to the Abraham Accords yet, and I'm, I, I don't think it, it's entirely willing to be a part of a corridor that connects Israel to uh, anywhere else in the world. Iraq, I think I would be even more skeptical because of, uh, 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 first of all, because obviously of, of, of Iraqi insecurity uh, and the, the, the unstable security situation in the country, but also of a uh, what is likely to be a, more, a much more pronounced domestic backlash, given the extent of Iran's influence in, in Iraq. Uh, against any trade corridor that that involves Israel, so I, I doubt that the re that uh, some of the regional players that uh, would ver would would readily uh, um, back or be a part uh, of of such a corridor. Ironically, I think the only real trade corridor to which India has signed on to is the international north south transport or transit corridor, which links India through Iran to Russia. And so, which is ultimately the antithesis of the U.S.'s uh, and I think the UAE's and, and Israel's geoeconomic designs for, for the region. And so I think to, to, to conclude, my main argument is that there are real obstacles and frictions in the way of any such geoeconomic, let alone geopolitical, uh, uh, um, uh, vocation materializing and transpiring for this minilateral initiative. This is a minilateral initiative whose potentialities, as I as I said, are are highly unclear, highly untentative, highly tentative at the moment. And I really think we should temper our expectations as to what it's likely to produce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Al Hassan. And um, your comments are uh, are pretty um, decisive on that point. And um, I would actually like to take this question to Ambassador Zofa. Uh, Dr. Al Hassan is is um, a skeptic about the geopolitical aspects of the bilateral, but also the geoeconomic. Uh, how do you see this? So, uh, I, listening to the to the uh, presentation of Dr. Al Hassan and uh, and Ambassador Suri, I, I find myself more, and I apologize for this, more on the side of, of Ambassador Suri on this one. I, I think. Um, uh, there are a lot of good points that I, I understood about the difficulties uh, of building up this uh, geoeconomic uh, um, um, uh, minilateral or, or, or space, as it were. Uh, and probably too early, I, I do tend to, to agree on, on the question of the connectivity. I'm not sure that will be the most important of the points. But on the other issues which are being discussed, and I, and I can talk about space, for example, space issues. I mean, we have four countries here which are, are extremely developed uh, in this in this uh, sphere, which is a crucial sphere for the future. Uh, and instantly, and I'm not talking about the defence field right now. I'm talking about uh, uh, telecommunications. I'm talking about basically about everything. Uh, and um, four serious countries which have decided to look uh, at how to move this thing forward. So, when four serious countries get their heads together. Uh, uh, the outcome will be something which they will uh, identify uh, as economically viable and as economically feasible. We may not see it right now. The, to the best of my understanding, the, the, the countries are, are, are right now, each country is going through its, its own uh, internal uh, processes to which uh, 
um, project should be put on the table, and that will come together in a, in a higher ranking uh, uh, um, uh, meeting somewhat later before the foreign minister's meeting, which might be in Dubai. And, and as a result of all of that, uh, the projects will be identified. I, I, I'm convinced that there are projects which are, which are uh, uh, certainly worthwhile, but the idea of the economic, the geoeconomic system, uh, which will uh, be brought up, built up, uh, is really to build on the uh, Abraham Accords. I mean, it wouldn't have happened without the Abraham Accords, obviously, um, but the interests of India in the Gulf, the interests of Israel in the stability of uh, and in the Middle East, West Asia, the interests of Israel in, in the stability and the development of, of, of this region, of course, the United States, it goes without saying. So I, 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 the reason I, I have problems with the word quad uh, is not that I'm against it uh, in sort of any type of uh, rabid form, but because it conjures up uh, the uh, Asian quad, uh, which is, of course, a much more geopolitical, it has a dedicated uh, uh, um, uh, um, thrust, uh, which this one doesn't. It's still quite amorphous, or doesn't yet. Uh, so I, I, I think it's difficult. I don't want to put myself into some sort of geopolitical equation, which is where, not where I'm coming from. So I think we're at the such early stage right now. I think there are economic, uh, uh, possible economic projects, time will tell, but the, we can identify we have identified quite a few from our side, which are, are good. I know that the UAE has as well, and India obviously uh, will. Uh, I, I'm not too worried about the identification of the projects. I'm not too worried about whether this will take off, maybe not as fast as we would like. Uh, but I am still uh, very, very wary about looking at the geopolitical aspects of it. I think that they don't exist here. I agree with you, and Dr. Al-Hassan, certainly uh, not at this particular point in time. Right. I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, bring in Dr. Pandey and um, well, ask her, uh, since we are actually um, having this debate, uh, what do you see could be the future of this minilateral and what aims can be identified for it? Um, thanks, Renan. Um, I'm sort of, you know, I think I fall a little more on the on Dr. Al Hassan's side of the of the ledger. Um, you know, there's a lot of optimism, and there's a lot that we can that can be done. But sort of, if, even if we forget the geopolitical, which I believe you know will be and should be a key part of this multilateral, look at the of the, at the economic dimension. Yes, there's a lot that we can do. Identify projects. Uh, each country can say what it would like done. That's fine, but at the end of the day, um, you know, sort of what sort of if India wants more economic investment from UAE and it wants the technology uh, from um, from Israel, there is a lot that India needs to do, and unfortunately, it is not done enough at its end to encourage or make it easier for countries to invest. Um, and to help build India's economy, whether it's on manufacturing or anywhere else, the number of regulations that India is imposing, uh, the number of impediments that India has imposed over the last few years have not come down. So there's a lot that India may want, there's a lot that Israel and the United Arab Emirates would be willing to do. Uh, but sort of, you know, there has to be some um, sort of, you know, some incentive. There has to be something that India is willing to offer. And unless that happens, we can have, we can identify any number of projects. And here I'll, I'll use a totally different example. Um, nine years ago, um, India and the U.S. sort of, you know, started something called the under the DTTI or the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, which is that the two countries would work on, you know, co sort of, you know, collaborating or manufacturing in the defense arena. Nine years later, it started off at that time, we were talking about working on or collaborating on fifth generation aircraft or, you know, sort of air or jet engine technology. Now it is down to collaborating on drones after nine years. So, you know, there's a lot one may want, but there's, there's, you need to either identify areas where, where India is willing to sort of, you know, where India is ready on the ground. And, you know, sort of we, we have uh, sort of, you know, we have eased the regulations and allowed and, and companies will find it easier. Otherwise, it will be a number of things that we identify, whether it's infrastructure, connectivity, energy, space, cyber. But it won't really result in sort of, you know, in, in actualities on the ground, um, unfortunately. I hope I've answered your question. 
Yes, you did. Um, Ambassador Suri, uh, as as a long time uh, long time uh, observer of the region, if you can put this for us in historical perspective, India, of course, has managed to balance uh, its relations with the three power centers of the region: Israel, Iran, and the Arab world. How does the minilateral fit into it, and do you see it as a shift away from its strategy, or actually fitting in? I think it it it, it fits in, into our strategy of having. Uh, uh, close relations with all the key actors, not being placed uh, in a situation of uh, either or. Uh, we've demonstrated it uh, in other situations as well that, uh, you know, um, our diplomacy is able to create enough room for us, enough space for us to, um, to use uh, Dr. Hassan's word to be promiscuous as well um, and, and to have uh, multiple uh, relationships at the same time. Um, you know, j j just to take uh, uh, one minute away on uh, uh, Dr. Pandey's and Dr. Hassan's comments, uh, I think um, it's a bit of a glass half full, half empty approach, right? So for, uh, you know, there's no question that ease of doing business in India is work in progress uh, and, and, and much more uh, needs to be done. But, you know, for every, um, say, Aramco Reliance deal that didn't go through, there was an Abu Dhabi Investment Authority Mubadala deal, in, deal with Geo that did go through. Um, uh, so for every uh, investment that didn't happen, there are others, uh, and I know the Emirati situation particularly well about the RDI investments into renewable energy, into highways, into uh, warehousing now, into real estate that are um, uh, coming in significant uh, uh, volumes. So I wouldn't just, I, I, you know, uh, I, the legacy issues are exactly what you call legacy issues. They are behind us now. And, uh, you know, we, we're moving forward on a lot of uh, uh, different areas. Um, we wouldn't have produced 42 unicorns uh, in the first 11 months of this year uh, if it were so hard to do business, or we wouldn't have the digital and financial payments architecture that we have uh, if, it, if we weren't moving in a certain direction. So I would just uh, maybe temper that pessimism a little bit and say that there is, <laughs> there is, a, there is a room to take a brighter uh, perspective. Um, Last point I would say is, um, you know, um, where there's a will, there's a way. I think the countries uh, uh, which have come together for this uh, grouping have uh, an intent behind it. Um, this is not uh, not a passing fancy that uh, uh, that uh, uh, just took place and uh, it's it's emerged. Uh, and and, and uh, I think. Uh, Again, if you go back to the experience of how the Asia-Pacific Quad evolved over the years, and, and I think even until as recently as three years back, it was a minilateral looking for a purpose. And then certainly China provided the purpose. But even today, if you look at all the records of the meetings, you will never find the word China in any of the utterances. Right. Uh, so I would just say, don't go by the spoken word. Uh, 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 there is much that is unspoken, which uh, exists nevertheless. OK, uh, Dr. Al Hassan, uh, since we are also looking at uh, changing West Asia, the shifting sands there, uh, which are which as uh, Ambassador Suri said, some of which was just unthinkable even one or two years ago. So uh, from that perspective, uh, what is the role of, uh, of Middle East, um, you know, as it sort of pivots closer to Asia, also balances its interests with the West? Uh, how, how do you see this? Absolutely. It is a dynamic and, and fast moving region. Um, uh, on this point of the Middle Eastern players themselves pivoting, so to speak, to Asia, uh, first of all, I, you know, I caution against making too much of this because, in fact, uh, 
um, the Arab Gulf states, especially the UAE and Saudi Arabia and others, have been engaged in uh, building and in diversifying their relationships beyond the realm of their traditional sec uh, security and strategic partnerships with the US and, and, the, and the Western powers, uh, at least since uh, uh, 2006, since the maiden visit of uh, the late King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia uh, to China and India. And I think there's been, since then, a gradual and incremental effort to build those relationships with Asia, which very much predate the, int the intensifying nature uh, and predate really the overheating, so to speak, of the uh, great power competition between uh, uh, the US uh, and China, and to a lesser extent, Russia. Uh, that being said, I think the great power competition uh, is a, uh, between the US and China is, I think, I view it as a source of a limitation for what this uh, minilateral can be and could possibly do. Uh, and the reason I say this is because the U.S. has really been uh, uh, engaged in uh, mounting pressure on its partners uh, uh, and allies in the region, Israel, the UAE, uh, and others, to limit their, the extent of their economic and technological engagement and relations with China. Uh, and so uh, Israel has resisted this to some extent. The UAE has resisted it, I believe, to a greater extent. It continues to do so. And we've seen in, 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 very, in, in, in the recent days sort of the outward manifestations of the tensions in U.S.-UAE relations as a result of the U.S. wanting to limit the UAE's engagement and, and, and the engagement of other uh, uh, its other partners in the region in economic and, and securitized economic sectors with China. And so we've seen uh, the U.S. imposing pressure on the UAE uh, to limit China's uh, involvement in its ports and logistics sector. Uh, we've seen um, uh, U.S. apply pressure on the UAE and, and the rest of the Arab Gulf states not to involve Huawei into their own telecommunications and 5G networks. Uh, and, and, and as a result of which, we're seeing the uh, UAE uh, threatening and, and, and actually suspending talks with the U.S. over the F-35s, no less. Now, whether this is a part of the negotiation dance uh, that, the, that the UAE is doing or, uh, with, with the U.S., or whether it, it, it really lim uh, highlights the limits of how much the U.S. can push the UAE and its, and its partners in the region to limit their engagement with China, uh, I think remains to be seen. The key point for us here is that the great power competition and U.S. pressure to, to, to limit what its partners, especially the UAE, which is most relevant for this discussion, can do with China, is going to, to place real limitations on the kinds of sectors and the extent of which uh, and the extent to which this minilateral grouping, which obviously involves the U.S., the UAE, Israel, and India, can do, especially in the areas of uh, emerging uh, 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 technologies. I think the other point I'd like to uh, raise here is this idea that uh, different motivations of the different um, uh, partners and members of this grouping will lead to different and potentially conflicting expectations. Uh, this idea of the U.S. wanting India and its other uh, partners to pick up a larger share of the burden, I think, is an important one. And I think if this is, if, if indeed it is true that uh, this is what underlies the U.S.'s, sort of, if, if this is the real core motivation for the U.S. in this one minilateral, then I think India will have to think very hard about what it's willing and, and not willing to do with the region uh, and the extent to which uh, its own expectations and its own a, a, a sort of conception of what its role should be aligned with those of the U.S. And if they don't, and if these different expectations which come out as this minilateral and, uh, uh, progresses over time, if these conflicting expectations become sharper and more acute, then we're likely to see more uh, uh, obstacles and so on. I really like Ambassador Suri's, and, and to conclude with this point, idea that for, for, for quite some time, the Quad was a minilateral uh, um, looking for a purpose, right? I'd say the qualitative and, and, and the fundamental distinction is that the Middle East is not the, the Indo-Pacific. The U.S. sees the Indo-Pacific as uh, uh, the theater of the future, so to speak. Uh, uh, and it's really rebalancing its engagement away from the Middle East. And so I think the U.S. has felt, under, uh, has felt itself under geopolitical pressure to, to, to find a, a, a clear uh, rationale and objective. And I think China is the natural objective, obviously, the natural raison d'etre for the Quad. It's not clear what this is going to look like in, in the Middle East. And I think the U.S., in its own strategic vision, 
sees its engagement in the Middle East as something that needs to be decreased, uh, uh, diminished, and, and not not increased, uh, uh, unlike unlike uh, the the uh, Indo-Pacific. Let's not forget that the inception of this multilateral grouping was almost pretty much accidental. It came a few days after the uh, 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 meeting between the Abraham Accords participants to mark the first anniversary. Uh, the Indian Minister of External Affairs, Dr. Jay Shankar, visited to Israel, where he seemed to hop on a virtual call with uh, 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 with the members of this grouping. So it really seems like the inception of this group was accidental. It's not the result of a of years long deliberation or of a clear strategic vision. Whether such a vision ends up uh, emerging uh, one way or another, I think really remains to be seen. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to quickly bring in the rest of our speakers to offer concluding thoughts. Um, we are here discussing a grouping which is only just two months old, so a lot of questions, a lot of speculation, and also debate. Um, ambassadors of, uh, if you can take a minute and and share your concluding thoughts. Uh, yes, just uh, literally one minute. I think uh, the words of uh, Dr. Al Hassan at the end there were were the uh, ultimate uh, uh, definition of where we are right now. The words remain to be seen. Of course, everything here remains to be seen. I, I don't really have a difficulty of the fact that this may have grown out of of something which was somehow ad hoc. That doesn't that doesn't trouble me in in the least because. Uh, uh, as I say, when we're talking about four uh, serious actors, uh, they can build something from uh, from scratch. But that's that's not the issue. And I, I, I do, however, think uh, that the uh, we have to be very wary about looking at geostrategic issues, as I said at the very beginning, and and uh, uh, looking at this as if it was some sort of wider implication. This is not the Asian Pacific Quad by any means. Uh, uh, even uh, even looking ten years ahead, it won't be. Uh, but I do honestly, uh, until you think, and speaking to some of the actors here, uh, think that uh, there is definitely potential for, for economic benefit for all of the, the, the parties involved. Israeli technology, UAE wherewithal in, in, in the trading, uh, uh, massive wherewithal in the trading, the, 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 in, the uh, uh, Indian, uh, well, what it brings to the table is, is in, in both in terms of its relations with the UAE uh, and its relations with Israel as well as the United States. Uh, including in, in, in its largest of the countries by far, uh, which uh, uh, begs for locational issues uh, being held there. Uh, I think there are uh, uh, potential massive uh, advantages here in the economic sphere, uh, but I, I do think that we should meet again in a year's time and uh, have a look and see if the words remain to be seen uh, uh, really and truly uh, are uh, as as vibrant as they are today, because uh, it's far too early uh, to say anything more than that at this stage. So I look forward to seeing you again next year. <laughs> Thank you. Or sooner than that, Dr. Pandey. Uh Thank you. Um, I agree with almost everything that Ambassador Sofa said. I mean, it's still something, it, it's, it's too new. Uh, there's a lot of ex expectation we have. There's a lot of cynicism and skepticism we have. But, you know, let's see what the new year, what the next year brings. I mean, are they going to be just conversations every two months or is there going to do something, you know, some projects, uh, some concrete proposals? Um, and, you know, I will add, then even if there isn't an implicit or overt geopolitical imperative, there is an underlying one. And so that issue will also need to be resolved, um, you know, sort of in order for this to actually become something more than an economic grouping um, or a fora which just meets once in a while. Thank you. Ambassador Suri. So, uh, look, uh, what India is uh, uh, showing is that uh, in terms of its look west and act west policy, which uh, came much later than the look east and act east policy, uh, is now getting something serious. Um, to give you an example that uh, when Prime Minister Modi goes to uh, UAE uh, soon, that will be his fourth visit to that country during his seven years in power. Um, that shows a degree of intent and seriousness uh, in terms of our emerging relationships in this uh, region. Maybe we are making up for lost time, but I would just say that um, uh, we actually don't find any problem in taking up some of the slack on the security side for the simple reason that we don't see this as a US issue. We see this as an Indian issue. Uh, this is our backyard, uh, uh, the, the Arabian Sea. Uh, 
And, and, and so uh, when th there were troubles two years back in the Gulf, uh, we were quite happy to send two very capable destroyers uh, to protect our shipping uh, and to demonstrate that we are not free riders in terms of the security uh, arrangements in the region. We have the capacity and willingness to to contribute uh, to uh, maritime security in, 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 in an area that historically has been part of our extended uh, neighborhood. Uh, so uh, uh, I think what you're going to see from the Indian side is uh, uh, that the new arrangement fits quite neatly uh, with the focus that we are putting, uh, placing on, on this. And uh, um, this is a new uh, mechanism that, will, uh, that we will uh, make use of. Right. Uh, so from the Indian side, India playing the role of a regional security provider. And as Ambassador's office said, um, when four serious uh, actors get together, they definitely can build something from scratch. We see the potential for economic security. And um, uh, the one for geopolitical imperative uh, is, um, is less defined. And I'm pretty sure we will be back to discuss this again. I want to thank all our speakers. Uh, today for joining us thank you for your uh, thank you for sharing your insights